Welcome back to Girl on the Gov, the podcast. Where we're shooting the shit with elected officials and candidates running for office to get to know the person beyond the politics. Because politicians needed a rebrand. Mm. All right. Moment of silence, guys. Moment mm. of silence. <laughs> Sheesh. Hate to hate to meet you all like this. <laughs> Uh, um, hmm. Well, it's safe to say that we were both a little bit bamboozled because we thought we'd be releasing this pod with a little bit of celebrations. Maybe we'd be taking a shot, you know? We, you know what? In retrospect, like knowing how it actually ended, I would have – I don't take shots. Like I would have taken a shot on this podcast if she would have won, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, honestly. I would have – You probably would have even gone for tequila, which you hate. You know, shoulda, woulda, coulda. Right. So missed opportunities for for certain things. Um, however, we obviously are are back. I can't say better than ever because we've we've got shit. No, we're like actually worse than ever. Yeah. yeah. Definitely on the corner of devastated, broken, and defeated, but we will come out of that. I think we are still in the fresh, raw moment of this heartbreaking loss i don't care about the work i put in i don't care about losing i'm a competitive person i'm a former athlete this that's the last thing i give a shit about i you know went into wednesday of last week just like genuinely shattered and worried and scared about like what's to come i'm just like trying to process emotions and like get into a clear-minded space because there is a big fight ahead and like we have to be ready ready to go and I think each day has gotten easier for me, but, you know, it still hurts. How about you? I honestly think I processed it really quickly because, and we talked about this a little bit on our conversation with V and Sammy, which we'll, we'll tell you guys about our guests, obviously, you know, in a few moments. But I think the devastation, like the feel of almost like betrayal of humanity that you yeah. felt and emotionally felt like that heartbreak of. I had that last year. Like I already mm-hmm. processed feeling like people would do horrible things and or do things that, how do I even phrase this, that just make you question people's humanity. And so to me, I feel like, well, I'm, I'm devastated by this. We have so much shit to do. Like, let's fucking go kind of element. I processed it a lot faster. Like it was almost like, I like, I was like, okay, this sucks. This is fucked up. This is bad for all of these reasons. And now we got to keep going. Because I don't think I ever got off of what is that line of thought when you're operating from like, like the adrenaline, yeah. you know, what I mean? like you're always like sort of on, like you're always sort of ready, ready for a fight. Like, I don't think I ever, that stopped for me in like the last year, even with the joy and like some of that. So I think I processed it a lot faster. So in an element of that, I'm a little bit more ready to go and think about like, how are we going about handling the next two years into midterms? How are we handling also next year with Virginia and New Jersey? How are we handling the next four years? And in my head, like I'm already in the point of like, how do we strategize to the best of our ability to put ourselves in the best possible positions to not only win again, but to make sure people are okay and to protect people and all of these things. So I think just being in like a little bit of a different spot. Yeah, for sure. I was so down bad. Like Wednesday, Thursday, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And Friday, like already was much better. Saturday was much better. Like also just being able to step away, uh, like get offline. Because I think the other thing, which we talk about in our interview in this episode, but like we can also talk about here is just like generally people jumping on this bus of like winning the why and trying to like be the one with the hottest take and the blame game is is in full force and we just want to say like nobody knows anything yet (laughs) and I think it's like important to also like if you are hurting or you know still processing everything like take that time to process because we don't even know what the fuck happened yet and we won't until we get data back and so just like take the time you need to like emotionally get right so that you're clear-minded when we like get data and we can come up with plans and, like move forward because yeah there's a lot of rhetoric out there right now of people saying it was this it was that it was this it was that and some of those things 
could definitely and probably will be correct, but also like exit polls aren't correct all the time. We That's the only thing we're basing a lot of this off of. And so just remember that and know that like more is to come, more clarity is to come. So it's probably best to just be offline right now and just take care of yourself because it's just, it's too much. And also people are like coming in with hot takes that aren't even logical or based in fact at this point. So, yeah. And I think what I'm seeing, and I'm curious if you're seeing this a little bit too, is the takes are reflective of sort of what social media has become, or maybe always has been, is it lacks nuance. Always. And I, think like I was trying to put this into words before, but I think Kentucky is like, to me, like the best example of this, of what we know thus far. Okay. In the state of Kentucky, we flipped the state Supreme Court. Okay. It's now has a Dem majority. We voters there also by 65%, again, with data as it is today, said absolutely not to a school voucher program, which would have constitutionally allowed taxpayer money to be used for sending kids to private and charter schools. At the same time as that, they reelected a Republican supermajority to the state legislature and overwhelmingly elected President Trump to the presidency. What I can like literally say- And also as a Democratic governor and a Mitch McConnell senator. It's, yeah. So what it shows to me is that people in and of themselves are nuanced. Mm -hmm. And it shows that it's, that you have to look at some of these races like bit by bit. You look at the state ledge there. Well, you know what? There's not a lot of inroads or infrastructure there for Dems to run for the state legislature. They have a huge time recruiting candidates there. So Mm -hmm. to say, oh, across the board, of course, Dems lost this whole state state legislature. Well, who is running? Was there any support for who is running? Right. There's like all those questions. At the same time, when you like think about the education piece, You have to think, okay, but like, were those voters aware of Trump wanting to defund public education? You have to think that some of those people didn't make that connection or weren't aware of that information because they clearly voted for public education being protected. So that's just like, and maybe not all of those takeaways are exactly accurate, but the point is, is there's not just one finite, well, it was inflation. Well, it was blah, 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 like whatever it was. Yeah. It's multitudes of things. It's a confluence of things. And each of these races needs to be looked at individually because I don't think you're going to get one blanket reason for each thing. No, I just definitely don't. not. And AOC has been posting some really interesting stories. I was like, last night she posted like all of these. She basically put one of those like question boxes and was like, by the way, like if anyone did vote for Trump and me in my district, like, please let me know. And all these people responded that they did do that and the, and the why. And like the Bernie and the AOC versus the Trump people like liking both of them. It's like wild. And that's been like a big, big takeaway of like, hmm, for me. But Trump just duped everyone onto this like populism approach. Kamala had like very populist economic policies in her platform. And Trump just duped them. And it's probably because of a lot of different things, which again, we just don't know yet of like, media ecosystem how he talks to people how we talk to people like but at the end of the day the things people want are progressive policies and solutions and they just didn't see that reflected in in this campaign and in some campaigns down the ballot as well so it's just crazy I think that's such a high level abstract take but that's all we can do at this point that's all we really know yeah I mean, I think it goes to show too that like labels don't really help anyone, if anything, right? Looked at those stories as well. And one of the big responses was, I like that you guys say it as it is and that you're not a part of like this establishment vibe, whatever. So what they're saying all in all is regardless of like what it is, like they don't like a label. They don't like a Republican. They don't like a Democrat. They don't like progressive. Like they don't like anything that like you put a label on then all of a sudden yeah. it's it's tainted and it becomes a part of a larger whole of something that they feel is against them yeah so and i like they've they've known that and that's what's frustrating yeah. too is like you know i've i've been in focus groups earlier this year i know they've been doing focus group, focus group after focus group polls after polls and generally like the consensus across 
everyone, no matter what party they're affiliated with, is like they are sick of politics. They they don't like it. They don't like how it functions. They don't like the the idea of the establishment. They think it's corrupt. And it's like, okay, you have to build that trust. Like that's where people are at. And I think that's generally like what we are seeing reflected in these results is this guy who was ousted by the establishment and who initially ran on an anti-establishment platform, he's back and I'm anti-establishment too. And here I am voting yeah. for him. I also think, and perhaps this is an abstract thought as well, the identity piece is played so wrong. I think that we, in this country, look at identity, which will connect to sort of what you're saying, as through the markers in which society gives to somebody else. So somebody's religion, somebody's race, somebody's ethnicity, somebody's gender identity, like what society looks like. But we don't look at like what the identity somebody wants to have for themselves. And so when we look at like someone that voted for Trump, and this is not everyone, this is just a certain amount of people, what they see is like not what we see, which I see a bunch of tool bags, to be honest. But what they see is a guy that is in their eyes, facts aside, self-made, makes a lot of money, wealthy, says what he wants and gets away with it, does what he wants, gets away with it. People feel like are he's under attack, but he still stands up. He still gets back up every day. And that's what they feel like they want for themselves. They want the privilege of being in that position, of being wealthy, yeah. able to do what the fuck that they want and say, you can't do anything for me. And I'm going to keep coming up a positive when you keep trying to hit me down. That's the identity mm -hmm. that so many people want to see across the board for themselves. And that's visualized in how those people operate. Again, whether for good, sure. bad, and different. But I think, again, it's the identity people want for themselves, not the identity that they have. Like, that's like, totally. you know what I mean? Like, you're not actually getting to know the person and like what they yeah. see. You're getting to know and what how... you see on them. That's not right. Well, 1000%. That's so true. And I think like, and and how you perceive someone like Trump and whether he is a self-made, rich, does what he wants, says what he wants, macho dude, people who see him that way were, he was painted to them in that way via the ways that they consume media. And I think there's been a big emphasis on media consumption and this like media ecosystem that we're living in. And what I was seeing and what I have seen is not that. He is not that. He's bankrupt companies he's a fraud he's got tiny little hands he wears makeup he's literally can't put a sentence together he doesn't make any sense and then you know people who consume a different type of media than me can see a completely different they can see like a big hot ufc fucking macho masculine man that they want to be and it's like that's been obviously a huge fracture in how people are moving and how people ended up voting in this election. And I just, yeah. it's hard. And I think, honestly, some of that has given me some solace of like, you know, when you consume media, it alters how you think about something and someone. And I am holding hope that just people saw something different than me. And because one of the initial like shocks and like feelings that hurt so bad was like literal rapist who has 20 counts of rape against him a convicted felon, bankruptcies, fraud, like all of the things people chose that over a very qualified, very compassionate candidate who is a black woman. And that is was the initial hurt for me of like, that's what people want. People will choose choose that over a woman. And that's was really hard, a hard pill yeah. to swallow and still is. And there's definitely still a cohort of people who did vote that way because they can't vote for a woman. And we like definitely should not look past that because that is very, very real. It was the same in 2016. It's the same now. It's so nuanced. Everyone has came at it from such a different angle. And a lot of Trump supporters would be like, no, I, I'm a big supporter of, of women. In fact, Trump's protecting women. <laughs> like That's what they think. That's what they saw through how, whatever they consumed. Which is bananas to us, but like, it, I think also, like you think about even in places where we win, we have to think about how many people still voted for the opposition. I was looking at North Carolina's numbers last night, and one of the things that I did see was despite like Josh Stein winning the governor's race, 
Over 2 million people, 2 million people voted for Mark Robinson, a guy that literally said, I'm a black Nazi and a gazillion other things, was peeping on girls in the locker rooms, crazy shit. And well, again, so happy that at the end of the day, he lost. There's something about those 2 million people that still voted for him. And we have to yeah. think about, we can't discard that in thinking yeah. about gender and race and everything else in between, because clearly yeah, it can't be, it, was, it can't be it just a, a swipe breaker. 2 million people that said, well, I'm a Republican and he's a Republican because we saw mm -hmm. plenty of people break with their party in both ways in this particular overall race. But those, those takeaways, yeah. still important, still an important I feel spot like to look. We're separating this into some buckets. And I feel like the first one we talked about was like, looking at the Democratic Party, like looking internally, like trying to, as best we can in this moment without the data, figure out what we did wrong. I think there's a laundry list of things. Number two, a bucket of just like media consumption. Like some people just didn't, just got a completely different view of these two candidates than other people. And that's one bucket or another bucket. Third bucket, I feel like is also just generally people being uninformed and unengaged, which obviously continues to be a theme like across the board for years and years and years, which is one of the reasons we started this whole podcast. People are very uninformed, I think as well. Maybe you saw one mailer or they saw one thing that said, oh, Republican for lowering taxes, check has my vote, you know, and people aren't doing their due, due diligence of like looking deeper. So there's, I think that third bucket that I find very real as well. And like, yeah, we have to and meet to people where they're at. To connect to that bucket, I think we obviously, again, hence why we're here, the civic education piece that's missing mm -hmm. is so huge. And it's so, it's paramount to this whole thing. I mean, I can't, the amount of people that I've, and this is not a shame game. This is like, people just don't know. Yeah. The amount of people that I've had to talk about the ballot measures, the abortion ballot measures with, and explain to them that if a national abortion ban at any level is passed, that that will trump literally pun intended yeah like what that will trump the state laws federal law trumps state law it doesn't matter if it's in the state's constitution like that is how that plays out so if you're in missouri and you voted for protecting and reproductive rights great happy about it awesome because obviously we're aligned in vision there but that doesn't protect you if there's a federal abortion ban mm -hmm. so if you voted for trump and you voted for that there's a clearly a huge disconnect. Some of that civic education, some of that is people literally thinking that Biden put in or overturned Roe v. Wade because it happened during his presidency. I mean, like the list goes on as to why people think that or are disconnected from that. And I don't want to shame anyone in that because there's such a deep yeah. civic education problem in this country. And I and because we have I, one side who like truly lies to people and just makes shit up as they go. Sure. And it's for just sure. like they're uninformed because they were told lies. Like as simple as that, you know, For and sure. it sucks. And I think yeah. the economy is another issue that is like the pure example of that, of like how after decades, like this has been a democratic problem for literal decades of like being bad for the economy. When the reality is every single democratic administration has created an economy for the past like 20, 20, 30 years has created an economy that was better off when that president left than when they started and they often inherited some type of economic mess they made it better it's booming and then because of the way the pendulum sw swings politically a republican will likely get back in and fuck it up and then you don't feel economic feelings good or bad until years after an administration when policies change for example, we're still living under a Trump tax plan right now. And that seems like I didn't do a great job explaining that concisely, but there is a way to do that. And like, we have failed at doing that over and over and over again. Obama tried this cycle. I think a lot of his campaigning, he was talking about that. Like he inherited my economy. Like Obama was saying that in yeah. these rallies, He's like trying to tell people. And it's like, but here's the thing. No Fox News watching person is listening to Obama on a mic. Exactly. Like, so that's, great for somebody that's already tuned in it's already checked their box in but like that message isn't breaking through that box at all and mm -hmm. that i where i go 
to the deeper levels of of issues with this whole situation is the fact that like this was a three month campaign. I, I don't know if it would have changed the game if we were in it longer. I think that like there could still have been so many issues. Let's not be real. But like that messaging, that turnaround time on that, clearly there was not enough time. But there also weren't economic messengers that felt right for everyday people. When Democrats message on the economy, they always say the unemployment rate and they always say the stock market and like those numbers. And those are important, right? But the average everyday person, they don't. And that's not their everyday. If they can't put food on the table or pay their rent, that's their economy and their economy is bad. So like we're dealing in old metrics and old messaging and I... I was saying this, but I think, that Kamala, that I think the Harris campaign did a good job at pivoting on that because like her platform was addressing people's actual economic right. concerns, which is price gouging, housing prices, et cetera. And I think, I think there's another like misogynistic layer that comes in here because clearly we had two candidates who were not treated the same. We had one candidate, Trump, who truly like lawless did not have a platform, just still does not have a platform or a policy plan at this point, aside from Project 2025, which he distanced himself from, versus Kamala was out there like over and over spewing what she had planned for her economic policies, including 30 million new homes, $25,000 in uh, first-time home buyer assistance, like literal things that you can easily say and point to, but the the rules just were not the same for the two of them. Yeah. You know, like she still got criticized for not having a plan when she was the only one that had a plan and she was saying it over and over and over again. And they were populist messages. She was coming after corporations for price gouging. Like, and that is definitely another misogynistic layer that lies here. And yeah, there's definitely probably a messaging problem there as well. That maybe we didn't do enough that we needed to, to reach people with those messages, but they were there. And that's the other thing. Like people didn't do their research, I guess, like not informed. Yeah. That's what I mean when I say not informed. Like you don't actually go go to her website, see the list of policies, and then come talk to me about her non-platform bullshit. Right. I got like it's that was literally so annoying. Right there. Right there. That I remember after the Call Her Daddy the interview, most. I was yeah, like livid because it was exactly that. It was like, I don't know her. Well, here are all these opportunities, here are all these podcasts she's going on to. Yes, she could have gone on more, and I wish she did for sure. But like there were opportunities outside of her own website that you could take upon yourself Mm -hmm. to actually like learn about her her candidacy and what was her plan for the future and people didn't do that or they Mm -hmm. didn't care or a a range of different things but i i do think even when we think about mainstream media which we could argue is mainstream or not mainstream or whatever but without going down that rabbit hole i do think that the coverage was constantly on Trump and always her second. And one of the things I've worried about, despite being a participant in it, and so I plead guilty on that, is that some of the insane shit that he says, we've turned into like TikTok trends and things of that nature, Mm. which while the same, you know, it it shows, oh, this guy said this insane, you know, thing like eating the dogs, eating the cats, whatever that line is. It's normalizing it. Yeah, we made this. That was be a like, big this thing is... we were messaging too. Like, don't repeat the lie. You have to call it out for its bullshit. When we make these funny trends, like that's what it does. It like repeats the lie and yeah. it normalizes it. And yeah, there was definitely a lot of that that ended up hurting us. <sighs> There's so many things. I do want to talk about a few positive bright spots though, because yeah, I feel like that's important. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's talk about the positive bright spots. Okay, the positive bright spots is Andy Kim won his Senate seat. Yeah. Okay, Maddie's just looking at me like, I'm going to kill you. So if you're not watching no, on YouTube. No, no, I'm game. I'm game. She's l- losing go. her shit over we here. We love Andy. Okay. We love we Andy. Do, we do love Andy, and he is a gem of a human, and I'm very excited to see the humility and humanity that he brings to this Senate seat. I think it's duly needed. He is somebody that is very well known for being able to have conversations across the aisle, so I'm excited to yeah. see that and how that plays out. I'm also excited to see both Angela also Brooks and Lisa Blunt Rochester, two black women powerhouses that are going to be in the Senate. Lisa Slotkin, Jewish mm-hmm. queen, dare I say. And the house is still up for grabs, but I don't not think looking we're great. Get it. Yeah, I think we have out of the like five remaining, I think we have one that we're that's actually leaning Dem and the others are toss ups lean and lean Republican. So we do expect a Trump trifecta. And I think 
we don't know what that is going to look like. I, it's truly the worst case scenario, especially for people who were sounding the alarm on Project 2025. And if indeed he is associated, which I don't trust the man. I know he is. He has the power to do the things in Project 2025. And if you don't know what it is, and if after he distanced himself from it, you kind of were like, okay, that's not real. Go look it up and go see what it's about because that is his plan. And maybe that's why he didn't publicly say much in terms of what he wanted to do policy-wise because it's already laid out in Project 2025. And so when you just have concepts of a plan that you can say publicly, but you have the secret evil plan behind the scenes, maybe that's what the what the plan was. Again, yeah, I've been saying nonstop since this result came through of like, oh my God, I wish more than anything I'm wrong. Like I truly, from my heart of hearts, want him to be the greatest president that, you, that America has ever seen. Like truly, I want it to not be that bad. I want him to do well. But from what we know, it's going to be really bad and it's going to hit vulnerable communities first and worst. But if Project 2025 does become our reality, like it's coming to a liberal city near you as well. So don't think that it's not. Yeah. Like Sam said earlier, like we have these ballot measures that pass, which is amazing. And it also just shows generally like where people stand on reproductive rights. Um, but a national abortion ban trumps it all. And I was, I've been talking to my dad about it too. And he's like, he doesn't think that that will happen because he raises a good point too of like a lot of this more extreme stuff that is in Project 2025 and just generally like that is more like Christian nationalist. He's not that. Like Trump's never been that. And he doesn't give a fuck about abortion. And he's now in this power that he can do whatever he wants. And that includes not doing the things that these Christian national groups even want, you know, and he's known to burn every fucking bridge of everyone he's ever worked with and any promises he might've made to people beforehand. He doesn't give a fuck. He'll break them all. Like he's him and Elon are going to end up hating each other. Him Mm -hmm. and RFK are going to end up hating each other. And so we just don't know like where he's going to land on a lot of this stuff. What he does care about is himself and making more money and maybe a group of his other rich buddies, like helping them make more money. And I can guarantee the economy will feel that. And I think that's the biggest, that's going to be the biggest hardship of these next four years is how fucked we are from an economic standpoint of, especially when looking at the things he wants to do, but on these social issues, it's interesting because he doesn't actually give a fuck. He was pandering to a, a base that he knows is misogynistic and racist, but he will definitely, he will definitely come through on his deportation pro- promise, which is For also, sure. I think, one of, if not the scariest part about what's to come is this mass deportation promise that he's made. For sure. I think it's, it's horrifying. It's terrifying. I think he was an interesting point and it was something I was thinking about this morning and also last night, just like how long is this like buddy ship with RFK Jr. going to last? I was like, yeah. remember Scaramucci? He, what, he lasts 24 hours as press secretary, something crazy. <laughs> like there are are some interesting points to that, right? Like narcissistic, egotistical men in a room. And mm-hmm. at a certain point when they've like hit a level, they're going to just eat each other. Yeah. And there will be a point where that happens. Next year, we we got some races on the ballot. We got a lot. There's local stuff, so make sure in your neck of the woods, you're checking that out. But we have the Virginia governor's race and the New Jersey governor's race and their state legislatures, which vital. We have a Virginia, we have a Virginia, oh. <laughs> we have a Republican governor in Virginia right now that we can oust. We have an increasingly red state in New Jersey that could elect a Republican. I don't know who's going to run yet. We got to protect that. We got to elect a Dem there as well. So there's stuff that we need to be acting on literally starting now to best protect ourselves. Because if anything, if anything, which I've seen in the last, all the the, the past administrations is having a strong Democratic governor is so fucking important. Yeah. Like I, and AG, I cannot, these are two positions That now I think are starting to get their flowers a little bit more, but they are so vital. But I also want to say too, for the House, in 2017, Trump had the House and they had a 47 seat majority in 2017. And now they're going to have like a five or six seat majority. So that's like something to also like maybe a deep breath about of like, there is a lot of caucusing that we can do to put in that work and try and block as much as we can. 
The other thing is that when Trump came in in 2017, Democrats only had five state trifectas. Now we have 17. So that's also just like another just deep breath of like, we have pathways to fight back. Again, not gaslighting anyone that like it's going to be bad, but we do have strongholds in places that will be really crucial to push back and fight back and, and hopefully prevent what some are saying is an authoritarian stronghold of our, of our country. Woo. Yeah. And the other thing too, just like as we look forward of like playing defense, also just like check in with your state and local representatives. I know that's like the least sexy thing to do, but check in with them. Make sure they like have plans in place for protecting you against Trump's America. Like in San Francisco, we have a new governor and he's like more moderate and governor, but I'm sorry, mayor. <laughs> And bet your ass, like, I'm DMing them and I'm being like, or I'm, and emailing them, be like, let me know your plan to like protect us if there's a national abortion ban, like, talk to us. So do that too. Do that to your your mayors and your locals, but also your state representatives and your house or your assembly or and your Senate, whatever um, structure you have in your state. But we yeah, will have to and- make sure we are holding those people accountable and checking in on them and being communicative with them. And to that point, we are putting together a mass Rolodex of all of the Dems that won the cycle, regardless of where they stand on the the big spectrum of the Big Ten, progressive to conservative Dem to everything, whatever. And it's going to have all of their social handles. So that way you can stay engaged with what they're doing. Yeah. And we get into this too more in this interview, but also just like, again, take care of yourself. Take this time. V, v, Sammy, Sammy and I talk about it. Just like live it up. Do you find joy in your personal life, find community in a person community? Because that's like, those are the things that are going to be able to keep us going. So just remember that. And And you know what? If that comes in the form of buying our new merch collection, by all means, we're not going to complain about it. Yeah. Retail therapy. Yeah. And if you guys are an OG, you will remember the When in Doubt with the Mount merch. Mm -hmm. We brought it back. Better quality merch, like comfort colors. And more pertinent than ever. Yeah. And it's like a new design. It's super cute. So check it out. It will be, as per usual, linked in the show notes and our newsletters, all the things. Yeah. We're unfortunately going to be in a really painful I told you so period. But like, we also can't do that. We can't do the I told you so. We have to bring more people in. If people start waking up to like, oh, fuck, maybe I shouldn't have voted this way. That's okay. Let people be wrong as much as we want to be fucking toxic and as much as I want to be toxic and petty. Don't be. Try your best not to be because, again, it's going to take all of us in these years to come to, like, build our tent, welcome more people back. And we have to welcome people with open arms back and be like, don't worry. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone has those days. So with that, I think we can introduce our two guests today. We get more into just, like, this post-election debrief. Because a good election debrief with friends is very necessary right now, so. For sure. And we brought on our friends from Betches and Under the Desk News. We've got V, we've got Sammy, and both combined are the American Fever Dream podcast. So, like, obviously, four podcasters, one virtual Zoom. Get into it. (laughs) Like, we really get into it. And honestly, we could have been on SpeakPipe for an eternity. I genuinely, like. Yeah. It. It's what happens. So without further ado, here is Sammy, Maddie, Sammy, and V. (laughs) All right, guys, this is the debrief of the debrief. This is podcasters or podcasters for political podcasters in one room. Well, sort of virtually talking about what we thought was going to be a celebration if Mm -hmm. I may put a broad strokes expectation that we all had and turned into a tragedy in every Yeah. Yeah. We butched this before, before election night and we're so excited to just bring friends together in a room and talk about all the fun things that were to be, but we're in a different place right now. I booked How are you so guys? many things. I booked so many things before election night thinking I would be on like celebration victory tour. Yeah. And I am like, I, I did a speaking event we talk about on our podcast, American Fever Dream, this past weekend, and I was supposed to be teaching them resilience through grief. No, I, I spent like an hour playing press secretary, answering questions I couldn't ask and getting screamed at. People are, you know, they're in a raw state. And 
you know, me trying to be like, we need to build resilience through grief was kind of akin to like when somebody dies and like your well-meaning aunt comes in and goes, they're in a better place. Get <laughs> fucked. They're not in a better place. This isn't the better place. So I was like, all right, I got to stop doing that. We're still in, you know, the death of a dream in many ways. Yeah, no doubt. Sammy, yeah, how are you? About, I mean, I was just like that. I was thinking about the, speaking of the death of a dream, I was thinking like, okay, so climate change, like there's so many years we're about to quote unquote lose on dire situations. And there's going to be so many people who are going to live in so much fear and experience so many horrors. And I just feel like we're on the cusp of this really, really trying time. And I can't even parse whether I'm trying to, my brain is like protecting itself mm. or if like, this is how it is. And, you know, you just have to kind of take it day by day and figure out how you're going to be okay and what you're going to do to try to protect yourself and other people. Mm -hmm. And I feel disappointed. I feel angry at many things. I feel a little bit stupid for, for thinking that for not realizing the extent to which people were not seeing what I thought they should or could have been seeing mm -hmm. and just been feeling very reflective a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot of feelings. It's so many feelings. And yeah, I mean, there's so much to unpack. I genuinely don't know where to start. I think there's like almost some like gaslighting I've been doing on myself of like, <laughs> Are, was I being dramatic? Like this whole year, especially like all of us working in this space of like messaging all of these issues and this, this candidate and everything to people, I'm like, is Project 2025 not real? Like, is everything going to be okay? Like, no. what, am, am I wrong? Because so many people voted for this guy and, and down the ballot, like what, what's going on? Am I wrong? That's been like my big, once I got all the tears out, like when I started reflecting, those are kind of the thoughts that I started to have of like, I, I mean, because I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm very wrong about all of the dangers that are to come. Well, right. Yeah. I think part of this is the psychological warfare. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. were you wrong or did the next day Black people receive mass texts that right. they were going to need to report to plantations? Like, yeah, there we have not started the deportation camps yet, but were you wrong? Because that happened. You know, yeah, I think private. so much of this is a psychological warfare mm -hmm. and we have not lived through a, an oppressive government. We should maybe ask some people who have, I think it's like, that's kind of what yeah. I've been thinking about. It's like, well, what is normal and to what extent is questioning your reality part and parcel of what living in a society like this is about? Can I tell you as a Buffalo Bills fan what it's like to believe <laughs> so fucking hard every year and have yeah. your heart broken every year? It's that, right? It's and and part and part of it, I know I will. I know when the midterms come, I'm just gonna be just as optimistic and passionate and excited to tell people about the great policies that we have and the thoughts we have and the people we have on our team. And I know in four years I'm gonna be just as excited to like get out there and fight whatever we we're up against. Because as a Buffalo Bills fan, I've been trained for this my entire life, okay? Every year we go into it. We haven't won the Super Bowl since like 1992, okay? So my entire life. We go into it and we're like, this is our year. You know, Josh has got this guy now and that's going on and we got better teams and the field is different and the air is crispier and the Farmer's Almanac says <laughs> we convince ourselves of all these things, right? The, the lake effect is going to give us an edge over the dolphins. We tell ourselves crazy things because that's part of building community and that's part of the fun of this fandom. And for me, when it happened, when when we lost to the Chiefs this past year, I cried so hard. We made some merch that had Buffalo broken hearts with Band-Aids on it. And we're like, oh, my gosh, we thought this was the end of the world, right? And where are we right now? We're one year from that, and we're like, Josh Allen's looking good. Josh Allen's Josh looking Allen good. Josh Allen looks real good. You know what I mean? He's looking good. I like that key on. We, we're making better choices. We'll <laughs> see. We're going to go all the way, right? That's part of it. So I don't think anybody has to feel stupid or or embarrassed for how passionate and how much love they put into this. Because like I said to Garrison Hayes, the night of the DNC, it was night four. And we were exhausted. And I was like, even if she doesn't win, they'll never take this away from me. They'll never take mm -hmm. the five months that I had with some of the best people I'll ever meet for the rest of my life, just trying so hard to include other people in the change and in the in the world that could be that we saw 
we saw a world that could be in spite of the way that it is. And that is something that I will always want to provide people and I will always believe is possible because it is possible and sometimes it does happen and I think it can happen again. Something mm-hmm. that is giving me hope is the collective despair that everybody has, right? It wasn't like a, oh, yeah. oops, let's move on. We maintain that passion. We're going to find our community, but we have to do it through reflection, through rest, through being quiet, through listening. Because if we just get into reacting again, we're going to be in the same place we've always been in. Yeah. And I have to say like the last like handful of days, the reactivity has been insufferable. Like to the point I'm like, oh my God, can everyone, people I agree with, just shut the fuck up. Genuinely. Because we're not learning anything. And I also think in doing the reactivity, what you're doing is killing the hope. And what we learned in this particular cycle is that hope actually puts people places. It actually yeah. the needle. It brought more people into the fold. Obviously, it wasn't like enough. We still lost, but we did bring more people in by inspiring hope. So like to kill that piece of it by everyone going in circles and pointing fingers and like looking like Looney Tunes, it just makes us yeah. look crazy. It doesn't actually do anything. So personally, I've been yeah. like, Ooh. Yeah. Honestly, like I have to say, so I agree that like the hope was critical. And I think that I am so much happier that I spent these months thinking that there was a chance and knowing that everyone gave it their all, like, because that Mm -hmm. happened, whether or not the, what, whatever the result was, Mm -hmm. what people did added to who they are and who we are. Right. And that is important. So all of that. Great. I'm so much happier than if, and Anyone who would have been like, anyone who wants to say Biden could have fucking won or no. done any better. Oh, no. no shot. Crazy. Okay. You didn't raise $1 billion because there was, because he there had a better chance. Inclusive. Okay. So just like, that's crazy. But when the idea of an open primary, okay, how was that going to happen? Like, please, the only thing that could have gone differently with the candidates where you didn't get her would have been if he dropped out in 2023 and said, I'm going to be a one-term president, which he did promise. So yeah. right. reserve it for him, but you can't go back to that. I actually think that people, maybe you're thinking about different people that I'm thinking about, that I think people have been so much less reactive than in 2016. In 2016, it was like, we're going to take it all to a level 100, and we're going to take <laughs> it all to a level 100 every single day until he is done. Mm-hmm. And I think that rather, and I think that that led to a lot of like shallow moves like the pussy hats and the yeah, signs yeah. and all this shit and like i actually think this i liked it at the time I though prefer... i, I want to stop you there I... though at the time that but... was the best reaction i'm not doing it again they're trying to do another one no. march. i'm not coming fuck that well because no, it's I'm so not different marching for it's shit. different i'm not I, marching it's... they're gonna kill Look. us i'm not trying to go down yeah. there after january 6th after the 2020 stuff after all this these people are lunatic nut jobs i'm not gonna say hey yeah. guess what there's gonna be a million women in dc come and get us <laughs> also what what is the point you do not have political power right. and marching should well, what 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 I'm happy that people are being reactive about where do we go wrong, what should we do, is because at least they're not doing that bullshit other than right. the blue bracelets, which just please do not even – I'm sorry. I'm very reactive <laughs> and angry right now. Yeah. But the, the lack – like the idea that symbolic gestures – it's like, yeah, they trained you coming yeah. out of the girl boss era that any right. of that shit mattered. What right. actually matters is – power and speaking to people and you can never post anything online for the rest of your life but you could convert people through conversation and everybody needs to figure out how to speak to their people stop doing it online for views Mm -hmm. and learn about what's going on and take this shit seriously i actually think that some of the blame that's going around is very warranted Mm -hmm. and i happen to know that if the democratic establishment (laughs) And the campaign had actually listened to any of those people who are now saying we should have done this, we should have done this, we should have done this. Maybe this would not have been the outcome Mm -hmm. because this message tested consultant class is ruining (laughs) everything for the rest of us and validating what the Republicans are saying, which is that we are this cosmopolitan party with college degrees and no real sense of the world. And we are out here defending fringe ideologies, which we're actually not. And Mm -hmm. We put up a, a DEI woman because that is a reflection of all of 
of of our culture when in of fact the white replacement it just fed yes. into all their bullshit it fed right into their yeah. bullshit and i think that on our quote unquote side what we need to stop doing is stop excluding people and we yeah. need to start converting people mm -hmm. and this idea of policing ourselves of oh you're a white woman so you don't get to you don't get to count or men are trash so don't come over here of, of course, course they're gonna go to the party that tells them they're <laughs> gods and flawless like, yeah Learn. We need to learn how to actually engage and not just like, you know, speak to people with respect as here I am yelling at everyone. <laughs> Pete, like, like be willing to go on Fox News, be willing yeah. to go on Rogan and actually speak their language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pete is it. The like Pete is the Pete. example of what we need. I'm also just like I'm ready for like silent majority era. Like I think it's yeah. time. Maybe we need to just like get fucking quiet for a second and like figure our shit out because the way we scream from the rooftops it really pushes a lot of people yeah. away in so many ways. It's I, like I think too mm -hmm. like the best example of this obviously Jewish girly pop speaking to yes. this is like October 7th and the reaction to that. And like mm -hmm. me, like my reaction to this was so much more muted because I went, I already lost faith in humanity. Like I already right. saw like how people can react and not listen and learn, do actually emulate the values that they're preaching and mm -hmm. screaming because they're not mm -hmm. doing them. And you like mm -hmm. wonder yeah. why people move to a party that was just like, hey, like open arms, come here. You so, can be the worst version of yourself and be yeah, in power. Yes, yeah. exactly. And they did excuse anti-Semitism. As oh, a fellow yeah. Jewish girly, this party did excuse anti-Semitism yeah. from certain people. They do it too. But that is, it doesn't make it okay to do it over here and to actually like turn Israel into this fulcrum issue that it should not be because Israel is a ally of the West historically and I think the failure to articulate this and to have people who could push back without losing all their incentives, it it is a culture like they're incentivized to say the craziest thing because they're going to get money and views and shock jock and, you know, shock jock popularity and the algorithms are going to feed them here. It's like, who are we going to attack today from our mm -hmm. own side who shares predominantly the same values as we do? And mm -hmm. my feeling was always like, I'm going to just, ignore. I always felt like I betches generally, like we're going to sidestep that bullshit. Like people don't want to hear about that. I am, I tend to like shy away from reactionary ideologies fundamentally. Like I don't, they make me uncomfortable, like no matter which side it's on. But I think that like you having this energy really just made your message fall on deaf ears. And that's why no one felt like they could get to know her because she kept saying the same thing. And it felt like she was always trying to do that mm -hmm. to avoid losing support, which yeah. may be true. There was also a little bit of like being too polite, right? There was this idea that we all had to praise Biden so much for finally stepping right. aside. Her first day of the entire DNC was dedicated to like thanking Biden. She was still super tied to Biden. No matter how much I tried to say, She'll get you an arms embargo. She will. She she will not be the one. She never said, let's make Gaza a uh, parking lot. She has been more on the side of humanitarianism. She's been a softer figure when it comes to like all the hurt that is happening around the world where Biden was a little more like, well, what's the paperwork say? She was like, what's the mm -hmm. paperwork say? And let's try to do as much harm reduction as we can within the reason of what the paperwork says. We've got treaties and <laughs> yeah. agreements with people. We can't just like throw them out the window because somebody doesn't like it today. So, it, but nobody was willing to wait for that. She got tied to Biden a whole bunch. And then there was this disinformation campaign that both linked into the pro-Palestinian movement, but also the abandoned Harris movement that was rooted in Russian and Iranian disinformation that was made to make anybody who was a trusted figure online discredited the same way that they work to discredit the mainstream media. So you had someone like me or like, I'm just going to say me, right? And there was an entire campaign to be like, you're a fed, you're an op, uh, you're paid by the DNC, you're a Zionist. I had to Google what Zionist was. I Sammy laughed at me. for the, I was like, I didn't know what it was. I, how the fuck do I know? I don't, I can't know everything. But I was like, <laughs> well, and that's then I look scary it up. Because I look it, it up made... and I'm like, Sammy, it just kind of says like, you know, you guys want to do your own thing, right? Like, I guess so. I guess so. I mean, I didn't know what it was, right? So I'm fighting all of this hate and it was so online. And then I was super paranoid in real life. And I think that's the first time I realized that what was happening on TikTok actually does not translate to real life yeah. because on TikTok, oh my gosh, you guys watch that. 
And it was like, no matter what I said, then it was like, well, you're a white woman. You're going to use white woman tears to try and get out of this. And I was like, I'm not even in it. You guys are saying the conspiracy theories about me and under the desk were so wild that anytime I tried to ever say anything about it, well, then I was like, it just spun it up more. And then when I would be in real life and I'd be like, yeah, you probably just think I'm like a fed and an op and a terrible person. They're like, what are you talking about? That was the first time that I realized that what happens on TikTok does not translate to real life. And I think that may have been a flaw in the, in the Harris campaign was like the popularity on TikTok yeah. and all the trends, but it didn't translate to voters. Now, yeah. the other thing I think that there's, this is why I've been quiet also. And I think we're all feeling this sort of reflection thing. We told you not to touch the stove. We told you it was hot. We told you that we lived in this kitchen before and the stove was hot then. Some people who were burned by the stove the first time when Trump was in the kitchen wanted to be burned by it again. We told you how it was manufactured, how the stove works, and they wanted to touch it. They thought touching the stove would somehow be the most martyrous thing to do, the most righteous, moral, high ground thing to do. So touch the fucking stove then. I'm not eating anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. not cooking in this kitchen. This kitchen's dirty. I'm going to go eat in my room. I'm not doing this, right? I'm eating only packaged goods. I'm not Lunch, cooking in this kitchen. I'm lunchables forever, <laughs> right? So, so in some ways, some of the people who want to say things like the third party vote did not affect her ability to be elected because they look at their one vote and they say, my one vote was one of 600,000 and it wouldn't have been enough to make up the gulf of how many people didn't show up to vote are not taking responsibility for the fact that for an entire fucking year, all you did was say, if you voted for aligned with the Democrats, did anything, you were voting for the devil. You were a horrible person. You weren't picking the lesser of two evils. You weren't working within your material conditions, which is the new word of the internet. The idea that people need to like work within their material conditions, i.e. saying, I would say, I'm a single issue voter and I'm voting to protect gay marriage. And they'd be like, well, that's because you love genocide. And I'm like, no, it's because I really care about my gay marriage. And when I'm looking at things I can control, that's the thing I can control. And now a lot of the third party voters are like, well, based on my material conditions, you can understand why I couldn't vote. And I'm like, first of all, shut up. Wait, what do you mean their material conditions? They're Meaning saying I'm, like, I'm rich enough that I don't have to care about, I'm, I'm rich enough, I'm protected by every other risk enough that I don't actually have to care about any of those things. And I can was, vote on quote unquote, genocide. Right. That I decided was genocide. They decided that other people's labor was going to save them from having to do theirs. And to this point, I said this during the thing. I was like, Jill Stein was never going to lead a successful revolution. She's never even won election. Not all revolution, not all revolutions are successful. Where is she now? And the The tweet of her like going back into the sewer. Like the people who (laughs) should be the people who should be mad at her for being tricked. I don't blame you if you get fooled. There's a, I was fooled by a lot. I voted for fucking Republicans until I was 24 years old. You get dumb. Like you do dumb things when you're young. You follow the wrong people, right? The fact that they followed her, believed her, whatever the case may be is fine, but reflect on that and own that. And don't try to excuse yourself by saying, well, my one vote wouldn't have mattered because it wasn't enough to make up the gulf when you participated in an online year-long harassment campaign against anybody who was trying to say anything that was like, well, you know what I mean? Third party votes historically have it have only uh, hurt the Democrats or whatever. Now they're trying to say, like, well, if she would have listened to us, she would have won. Or would she have lost 88 percent of Jewish women? You can't you can't make up like things that aren't true. Yeah. But I but there, ugh, I don't even I know would what I argue that about. they're that the campaign online was more harmful than even if none of those people voted at all. Because there was a lot of apathy, right? The campaign online was one, rife with Russian and Iranian disinformation. Not just the people, there's many movements within it too, right? There's the authentic pro-Palestinian movement. That's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the online kind of like Madeline Pendleton of it all, white leftist, moral superiority, um, talking up both sides of their ass stuff, right? Those people who spent the year long crusade where no matter what anybody did, it wasn't enough. Or if anybody rose up, even in that organization, they were suddenly shot down. Like I think of Aaron Hadamer, who worked really hard with Operation Olive Branch to try and get mutual aid to Palestinian families who were struggling to be able to escape. Well, she did a news interview and all of a sudden everybody turned on her because she was a white woman taking the attention away from the actual people and centering herself. And it was like, what? Look, let them let them keep doing it until there's just one perfect person with all the right <laughs> ideological views and yeah. no one to praise them because there's no one left on the side. Yeah. They just yeah. need themselves. And I think like that is an unfortunate trait of just like the left in general is like, that's what we do. And that in and of itself, like opening up the tent, bringing more people in is so necessary. And those conversations. And I think the point earlier of those like conversations offline, like I can say like very specifically from like starting girl on the gov because some of my friends weren't registered to vote. 
All mm-hmm. my college best friends, they all are registered to vote. They all turned out to yeah. vote. They all voted for Kamala and Democrats right. up and down the ballot as a result of conversations had over a series of years yeah. offline. Yeah. Like, yes, that they cannot needle mover. Right. Right. This is the other thing. It's like Democrats led by consultants. And and this isn't just about Kamala Harris or, or presidential race. I'm talking about elected officials throughout the Democratic Party. There's not this sense of like, I'm going to work for my district and not worry about this other stuff. I'm not going to worry about whether there's trans kids in sports. That isn't or it's if not my even constituents happening, come yeah. to me and tell me that's an issue. We talk about it. But I'm not weighing in on another district and all this mm. bullshit because, again, where I go back to, like, the reactive ideology is, like, and why I've never, like, tried to fall on either side of those things is because all you do is add to it. You just make it worse. And then you just lose credibility to the other side because no one's actually looking at these things, like, in any way closely. So mm. just jumping into that conversation is so into any of those conversations is so deeply pointless and actually just makes it worse and feeds that culture when behind it, you just have all these normal people who just want their roads to be paved and their groceries to be affordable Mm -hmm. and to feel like they're not going to die if they have a miscarriage. Like, Mm -hmm. and I think that's what was so effective about college educated white women, Mm -hmm. like your friends. It's like, just speaking to the people in your life, like stop performing online and have actual dialogue, like look people in the eye for once. But I not did your look, camera. I mean, the thing that shocked me so much about the loss was the fact that I could not name one person in my extended life that wasn't sure that she was going to win, which includes yeah. my dad and his golfing buddies in Florida who wanted to vote for Kamala. Liz they Shane voted Republicans. for Republicans down ballot in many ways, like for mayor and whatnot. They didn't vote for Rick Scott because they didn't like what he did with the hurricanes and they didn't think he was effective. And they didn't vote for Trump because they were sick of it. They were like, I'm so sick of hearing about him. I'm so sick of this bullshit. My girl, my, my girl dad, I don't, my kids are pissed. Like, I'm just, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going for him again. So to have them, the villages in Florida go for her, all these different people that it wasn't just my eco chamber. There wasn't one person in my life or extended life up through and including Megan McCain, who was like, nah, I think she's got it. Elitist. Yeah, no, that's. Been the really the hardest part is the shock factor. Yeah. Cause it's like you're grieving, but you're also grieving like a sudden loss, like a sudden death, a sudden tragedy that's like yeah. adds to the pain even more so. And it makes it just harder to wrap your head around. And I think we just generally need to take the time to do that, to like feel it all, to take the time to like yeah. debrief it all, wrap our heads around it. Cause that does take time and it is something that's painful and real. So just giving yourself grace and everyone grace to like, this is our time to just process. Mm -hmm. And then we need to come up with our plan that's different and brings more people in, doesn't push people out. And And that is maybe the thing with the third party voters, right? Like I'm very mad about a lot of it, but it wasn't just their fault. They're just one part of the whole part. It's partly my fault. It's partly a lot of people's fault if we want to place blame. So when we're looking at the, the Jill Stein voter, let's say in particular, there was something about that campaign that made them believe so much that they did it, whether that was misguided or not, or they're learning a hard lesson on this side or not. How do we make sure next time it comes up? They don't vote for her. My brother-in-law voted for her in 2016, and he did not vote for her this time because he also learned, oh, man, that lady tricked me. She was really promising me and making me feel like I was going to be a part of something that was going to be new. But now I know better, right? It's like, fool me once. Okay. But how do we not ostracize those people who believed in her message? And what can we take into the party to say, okay, you know what? Some of these things really resonated. She wasn't the right person to lead it. She'll never be, and she'll be back in 2028. How do we How do we do harm reduction against people falling for that again. Yeah. And I think it's like, you know, I feel like this conversation, we've really taken the time to talk internally about us, just like the progressive left, the Democrats. Yeah. But there's also obviously a lot of people who voted for Trump and like sure. who maybe don't align with him and like actually have progressive values and we're duped into thinking he's the one that's going to do that. Mm-hmm. So that's a whole nother conversation. And I think a big bulk of these election results is yeah. people, yeah, if you like break down policies and in issues, People who voted for Trump are like very progressive and probably Mm -hmm. if there was a mask on which candidate was doing what, they they would go Kamala every time if they actually knew what she was promising. So that's a whole nother, yeah, a whole nother thing. 
I also, but, well, there was that there were there was the data where it's like the the biggest predictor, I think, of which party you vote for was if you could answer those questions about the economy correctly, about yeah. cr economy and crime and to ignore the disinformation and the media ecosystem that we're functioning in, considering that I think his campaign's biggest strength was how freely they would speak. So it all just gets washed out on and people connected to them. Like that's why people listen to podcasts because they want to feel yeah. like it's real. And well, free thinkers. Don't want to be lonely. But a lot of it <laughs> might look, our podcast is to inform. This is what you guys do too, right? It's to inform, but it's also to keep people company. The mm -hmm. interesting the show I had before was entirely to keep people company. I built that show to be something that you listen to while you're walking around home goods by yourself, while you're waiting in line to pick up your kids uh, from the bus and whatnot. The purpose was to just keep you company. And that is the thing that they have done well on the right is to capture the attention and the company of young men in particular who don't feel like they have any place to go to. One, they've been told their entire life, all men are trash, right? Then they've been told like, oh, whether they are, they're not developed. So they're looking at things and saying, Hey, there's no program that makes sure that I'm going to be okay. And I don't feel like I have privilege. We're telling blue collar that uh, the sons of blue collar workers in Appalachia that they have privilege. And they're looking at a dirt floor and going, what do you mean? I have privilege. Like, what are you talking about? My, I watch myself and my family struggle all the time. And then they get these podcasts that make them Joe Rogan going on for three hours, that's company, but it's background noise and it stays mm -hmm. with them and it makes them feel included. And that's why they didn't have anywhere to go to celebrate when they won because they don't actually have community. They have these rugged individual silos that they live in and they are all based around their collective hate for something, their collective dissatisfaction with something that's a lot easier to motivate people around, but it keeps them lonely. That makes it easier for us to say, you know what? We fucked up. And we didn't include you and we're not hearing you. And we are telling people who live with dirt floors that they have privilege simply because of the color of their skin. And while there is some privilege to being able to yeah. exist in this world in white skin, it's not the level of privilege that we are putting on them where they're hearing, I didn't get to go to college. I don't have any Gotta fucking get money. Out of jail I got a car. job at, I, I, yeah. got, I got a job at 12 years old. My uncle's in prison for, for doing stupid shit or selling drugs or whatever the case may be. And they felt more aligned. We all laughed when we said that Trump got arrested and he said, people are going to feel more like me. They're going to feel like I'm one of them. They did. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And, and the thing is with like the, the take aside, you know, the parasocial relationships that influencers and podcasters now enable mm -hmm. being able to go on a podcast and flesh out your idea beyond a slogan is something that the Democrats really did not do. Yeah. Like we did, we've never known how to do that. Well, the you thing is, set me out there do as a not, surrogate. Do you not know how to do it? <laughs> I'll talk to well, you for well, days. Question, is, question: Do you not know how to do it, or do you not you, do, or do they refuse to do it they're because afraid. they're nervous about little things and and not being able to stand behind their 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 idea? Like Bernie Sanders can do that. Mm -hmm. AOC can do that. There are messengers in this party who could do that. And I think that the campaign was run by people who think that you didn't need to do that and that you were going to get people out by ground game and you were going to get people out with your good vibes and your celebrity endorsements. Mm -hmm. And actually, people just want to feel connected to the person who's more influential to them. And it is the podcaster and it is yeah. the influencer. And it's not doesn't have to be Joe Rogan. It can be smaller. Like they can mm -hmm. be, you know, there's a reason that, Brands pay micro influencers as a whole strategy sometimes. And I mm -hmm. just think that like they need to have more issue fluent messengers and it doesn't have to be like, we are committing to X, Y, Z. They just need to be able to go out there and speak out a progressive, forget right or left. I think we need to stop talking about right or left. I think we need to start speaking about things coded blue, red, Republican, yeah. Democrat. It needs to be about the people and mm, yeah. how all this Universal. corruption is the problem that has that has led their lives to be to to all these you know to towns that are completely like divested from and why people are living on dirt floors and don't have a safety net that is because of the corruption of yeah. wealthy billionaire elites whose whole entire business model is built on doing that. And that mm -hmm. is very different than the capitalism and the American dream that we had been talking about, where you run a real business and you make real profits. Not, you know, a real business is not capturing the government to then have the laws changed so that it becomes more lucrative for them to pay 
$100 million to a lobbyist because they're going to actually save $2 billion on their taxes. Right. That is the problem with what yeah. is going on here. And the Democrats do not have anyone besides maybe Bernie Sanders who can articulate these problems. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, Nancy I is the number one stunt girly. She's, she's on unusual whales all the time. But I'm going to tell you right. what. I think we should start taking that George Soros money I was alleged to have been taking all this time. Because those <laughs> there fucks is George were taking... Soros money. It didn't but work. It didn't listen, work. Listen, those fucks were taking Peter Thiel money. And he wasn't putting any strings on it, right? He was like, just run a podcast. Just take their attention. Just keep them company. Just fill them full of these talking points and we'll keep the money coming. Don't worry, Tim Pool. Don't worry, this one. Don't worry, that one. Didn't matter if there was substance or if it was true. It was about keeping them company and getting them hooked. I'm going to st- I mean, we, I don't know. We got to start You're taking right. billionaire money to, well, to just yeah, keep people well, hooked. Here's the thing. Need, this is not going to work because we can't, it can't be like our billionaires are fair or not manipulating you the way their billionaires are. We need to right. win with a message and messengers. And like, it's not impossible unless you believe that evil will prevail. Like yeah. in all circumstances, we can win. You don't need to take it, I don't think that Bill. No, we absolutely a new do party. need people to invest Look, okay, in new media. Sure. Okay, billionaires, please give us some money. But I do not think <laughs> that 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 if it be if it becomes just another fight backed by billionaires, we are going to end up in the same place. That's why no. we're here because Sammy, the people I'm running the you. party. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm saying when on TikTok the men were like, you know what, we gave the ladies a chance to talk. We need to create our own Joe Rogan and our own Tucker Carlson. No, we don't, babe. We tried. We had that before, and we still have it. It's called John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and all these other people. We do not need more men with microphones to try and debate or do, like, <laughs> all this kind of bro stuff. What we need is people to invest in actual new media that educates, informs, and includes people. Support our show. Support the girl in the gov. <laughs> yeah. Oh, literally. Let I- the money flow. I think like we can all speak from experience of like the last number of years of, you know, trying to make a go of these things. And it is a really, really tough investor, you know, landscape for left media and Mm -hmm. media across the board, quite honestly, because we're not going to make them many returns. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think too, in the like conversations we had, they want a very distinct metric of well, how many people are you going to get registered to vote? And that's the only metric they can think in. They do not think in influence at all. Because I could say from having a marketing PR and influencer background prior to Mm -hmm. this, like that was one of the biggest issues that we would have with clients is they would want, okay, well, how many impressions did that make? How many like dollars did we get back on the, the backlinks? Like very specific metrics. And if it wasn't that, it didn't matter to them, despite like then- their name being out there and that information being out there and having a long game impact. And I think on the left, we don't have a long game strategy and the investment shows that it's like, Mm -hmm. and even too, as I go on this tirade with the influencer strategy that was in place this year by the campaign. I mean, the DNC thing was so last minute. I mean, I didn't even bother to apply. It was like, I've got plans. I'm going to be on a bachelorette. Like y'all are like so behind the game on this. When we look at influence to your point taylor swift endorsing the campaign we thought was such a big thing and it obviously resulted in a lot of voter registrations and whatnot but a taylor swift ticket is still kind of catering to people who've got four to seven hundred dollars for the cheap seats you know what i mean we had those people when you look at uh the sort of like other side of music and culture and whatnot that's a 20 dollar ticket and a tailgate that's a NASCAR race. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're more accessible spaces. Should the Democrats next time not worry about getting an MLB player to endorse them and get a Savannah banana to endorse them, right? Like where yeah. are we at with oh God, the yeah. new media, with these new influencers, with like creating spaces that are affordable, that are for families where they see us, you know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and, and we are there because we are those people. We just thought, you know, if we could top down it, which is always the thing with, you know, with everybody, right, is, oh, we're going to top down it. And it's like, no, you got to bottom up it. Like we could have had, you know, so much more of this, like when I went to the North Carolina County Fair, there was a ton of Republican stuff and there was a Trump merch booth set up. Why weren't we there? You know, I mean, we could have been there. You got to meet people at the 13 to $20 ticket that we can afford and not the $700, you know, Beyonce. Such a good point. Well, there's a reason that it, it, got painted as the party of elites because yeah. it is all these college educated voters. And to your point about, you know, how they were looking at metrics and voter registration, that's what happens when the whole game is run by people who came from McKinsey, right. like not people who actually like live on the internet, digital creatures. And I actually think the best thing the Harris campaign did was the Kamala HQ account, but that's not yes. the candidate. 
Right. That's very different. And that's also very different than having official celebrities at the events versus just celebrities talking about it to their own audiences. And again, it was this top down approach that just is very, very 90s press junket. I didn't need Kerry Washington all four nights of the DNC. I needed them to not cut the Tennessee three from being able to speak. I didn't yeah. need, uh, you know, Pink to do a whole entire performance, which was fun and I enjoyed it. Oh. I needed Rua Roman, who was the Palestinian woman elected to the Georgia um, state level congresswoman, to get her one minute to tell her speech, which was like, I as a Muslim and Palestinian woman am voting for Kamala Harris and here's why. And I need the rest of the Internet to stop using my community as a means to try and put her down. That's what we needed. And I think, yeah. you know, you want to blame Jamie or whoever else. There was a couple of things that I hope next time we get right, because I want the Tennessee three would have had more impact than Kerry Washington ever could have. Rua Roman could have had more impact than anybody who was trying to say, you know, she becomes the mascot for like the truth and speaking for this population that isn't just, you know, Rashida Tlaib or Dearborn in Michigan or whoever. There was mm -hmm. there was an alternate there. And I, I think those are some of the misses that we can write down and we can say, hey, we really learned a hard lesson from that. The rich celebrities and the Goldman Sachs economists, all of these things the was a Cheney. failure to <laughs> was a failure to misread that what people wanted was someone who they felt emotionally was gonna fight for them. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I think we learned a lot. And that's something that I love about us is like we do learn and we talk and we get angry and we have a little snack and then we talk again and we talk again. But I do think that if the older establishment won't pass the baton of power, then it's on us to take it. And I do yeah. think that there are a lot of things that I was willing to be, you know, guided on when it came to how this was going to work that I wouldn't be in the future. And then I hope that we are taking a stronger stand in the future to say like, no, we're not going to spend this much time trying to get the Taylor Swift endorsement, right? Like it's right. going to be what it is. She, yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be, I honestly, Whatever. like, so I always am a hopeful person. That's part of my allure, right? And I, yeah. I found so much good in this election with the fact that, yeah, it went for Trump or whatever, but seven states now have protections for abortion, including Missouri. Angela also Brooks beat Republican darling Larry Hogan. Like, there's a lot to be proud of, of what we did. And it's like, it's never quite over. It's like, there's a lot to be proud of. There's, we're going to watch the tapes and we're going to learn better. And just like the Buffalo Bills, I'm going to always believe that we're going to win the Super Bowl and we're going to try again. Yeah. We got to go back and we got to go in the film. We're going to go back we gotta in. We got to go in the back. film. Yep. And yep. I'll tell you what, I'm going to put that, I'm going to put all my Bills shit away. I'm going to put my Harris Wall stuff away and I'm going to take that shit right out when it comes for the midterms. I'm going to have that same kind yep. of enthusiasm because that is what makes this country great. I was wondering and I do what believe to do in with the American promise. I'll I'm just store it. it. I'm oh, yeah. it's going to be so great in 30 years when it's like, it's like Bush Gore merch. Uh, okay, like, so yeah, I, you know I, I bought a pair. Yeah. I bought a pair of white chucks five months ago, the day that she became the candidate, and I wore them to every single thing that I did, and they are worn. And to me, when I look at those white chucks, I'm like, I will remember all the friends I made, all the things I learned, how hard I worked, how enthusiastic we were, what it felt like to be a part of that world. The rights um, I lost. The rights I lost. And I'm putting them together with things that like are for me, right? There's like what we're going to do to try and, and better America, which is always going to happen. America has had worse times. They will have worse times in the future and they will have good times. So we're, we're not giving up. But I want to be able to look at that stuff and be able to tell the story of like, so not you don't just because you don't win doesn't mean it didn't matter. And I want, you know, my niece and stuff to be like, oh, my God, those were your shoes from the campaign when you did yeah. this incredible thing, even though you didn't win. It was still That's really so incredible. Cute. Yeah. I you got to have that. those moments. Really? I'm not embarrassed of anything I did. And there's not one more thing I could have done. It's like, yeah. you, you know, when like my grandma died, I was sad, but I was like, I couldn't have loved her anymore. I called her every single yeah. day at 5 p.m. There's not one more story I could have asked her about. There's not one more thing I could have gotten from her. And when she passed, I was sad, but I also took all of that. And and I was hat and I just lived in all the happy memories and the things I learned from her. And I wish she could be here. I wish Kamala Harris was president, but she's not. But that doesn't mean that everything we did together wasn't worth it. For sure. One thousand percent. I think to like closing note, it also it's yeah. like looking at the analysis, like we need to be also looking at like what we did do well. Because yeah. we did have some wins, right? There was a lot of wins. Yeah. yeah. Like we flipped the Kentucky State Supreme Court. Like 
I taught Jojo Siwa's ex-girlfriend about abortion policy, and she was very effective. Avery Cyrus' ladder of engagement is the biggest win of this year. She was (laughs) incredible. Her and Cole Perez also, like these kids who would have never, you would have never thought somebody like that would be interested in politics, learned, was enthusiastic, and will be a future leader that is going to continue to spread that message and is going to continue to give people hope. Because at the end of this, I had a bunch of kids in my DMs telling me that they don't want to be on this planet anymore. And I was like, you don't get to you don't get to decide that you're staying. I'm staying. This isn't the end. We're going to continue to fight. Look at all these people that we met that are that are in your world right now. You got to stick around and see how it's going to turn out. We're not going to give up. And I think Avery Cyrus is such a great example of some of the things that we did well, because you took somebody who went from honestly did not have to get excited or interested about this, had a perfectly fine life before this actually took a lot of hits for getting involved in this. And, and came so far and helped so many people. And that is the work we need to continue to build yeah. on and do better at. It's like, we don't necessarily have to create the next Joe Rogan, but who no. is who is on that trajectory? Who can we tap into this movement and who can we get on our side that's like already built a platform, already there? Like, yeah. how can we be strategic in those ways? And we don't have to duplicate their stuff, but we can create, be strategic and find what works for us in this coalition we want to build. But- Yeah, look at Anderson Clayton. It doesn't even have to be a celebrity or an influencer. Anderson Clayton, 26 years old, the Democratic chair of North Carolina. That girl, what an incredible, like, thing to be building off of. Mm -hmm. People like Anderson Clayton, we're going to find more of her in more states, and that's going to be a thing. We've got possibility models where we never had them before, and that is interesting and exciting. Yeah, and we just, like, from the first Trump win and the first Trump term, like, we, we, we created something amazing and so many amazing things were created from that and that's just only gonna go up from here in this moment which is exciting an exciting piece of what's next but we will let you guys go be ever since you said home goods i was like oh my god i need to go to home goods that sounds go to home like the best thing put on our show i will admit i went (laughs) shopping yesterday and it it helped yeah yeah i put up all my christmas decorations all i yes i think i need to do that you gotta you gotta find the joy you know what, Joe Biden's president, a bit. Joe Biden's president until January 19th, January mm-hmm. 20th at noon, oh. right? Live it up. It's okay. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to, to cry. We saw the pictures of Kamala Harris playing checkers or connect four with her grandnieces. Like, it's okay. And, and you know, Trump's standing at, in front of a machine that he doesn't understand. Even if he pushes every single button and fucks it up, he could not do nearly the amount of damage that he would do if he knew how to work that machine. And I believe that <laughs> yeah. there are helpers all along the way who are going to try to jam up his gears as much as possible. Folks that we don't know or see, but that will – you have to believe that people are inherently good and they're going to eventually come to the right decision. And so that's where I'm at. I, I would advise living every day one at a time because just short-term decisions just what's the like, next thing i'm going to do that's all you got to like, do like was it was it nora efron or or maybe i think it was nora efron who would use the fancy silverware every day yeah and someone would say that was very strange and she said all there is is every day right yeah. so that's how we got to live yep and yeah. you know just because there are horrors going on does not mean that you cannot experience really beautiful moments and yeah yeah and in order to endure like we have to find the joy and the peace and the exciting pieces of our lives and find community be in in irl with people like try and do your best in person community because that's gonna what is what's gonna energize us for this fight ahead well thanks for having us on gals oh thanks for coming thanks for ranting with us on that note about being in community, please check out my book, Democracy in Retrograde, yes. How to Make Changes Big and Small in Our Country and Our Lives, because it is really all about that. We wrote this before the election, if you're a fan of Emily. Yeah, are you Holmes. psychic? Are you clairvoyant? I know. What's going on? <laughs> like, honestly, like, I, I'm I'm not going to claim it on TikTok, but I do have, like, a, a Reiki healer has told me that I She's am. She's very an, intuitive. Mm-hmm. And I, look, we wrote this as a, this book is nonpartisan. It is, and I don't say that I, it's, it is, and it's not for the 2024 election. It is for a lifelong personal paradigm shift yeah. about how engaging your community is self-care. And that is how we move things forward. So check out Democracy in Retrograde yes. and American Fever Dream and the morning announcements. Heck yeah. Thank you, Thank you both. Bye. Thank you.